I'm Mark Sponsor with the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, May 15th. Storm Surf. Waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people. All the time. No hype. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Click the little icon down in the lower right hand corner. And if you have any questions, give us a comment. Be sure to answer. All right, let's get to work. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean. Not a whole lot going on at the moment. Little gale just off of Antarctica, generating 26 foot seas, but all aimed at ice there, and no swell is being generated. All right, let's go take a look at the jet stream. Anywhere you are, jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their path. We're looking for a trough, a push in the jet to the north that helps create a clockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. And in the southern hemi, that's the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's deep enough, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough and aimed at your beach, generate uh, seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, turn into swell. Swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. So we have a decent trough here trying to develop. Uh, New Zealand's right there. So southeast of New Zealand. Uh, winds in the yeah, 120 knot range pushing up into it. That'll help uh, support low pressure development there. The trough continues as we go into Monday. Maybe a little bit of additional wind energy joining it as we get into Tuesday. And then it pushes to the far uh, southeast Pacific and then out of the Southern California swell window. A big ridge builds in below or behind. That in turn creates high pressure, does nothing for storm generation. But a little bit of a trough tries to set up under New Zealand as we get into Thursday and Friday, maybe getting reinforced some as we get Saturday into Sunday, actually looking fairly decent as we get into later Sunday, kind of back where we are right now. So there is upper level support for two potential gales in the South Pacific looking forward. All right, let's go take a look down at the surface. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds, not a whole lot going on. This one gale here in the far southeast, deep south Pacific, not really doing anything, nothing aimed at us. But as we get into Monday, a gale is forecast developing in that trough we saw southeast of New Zealand with a 45 knot, we'll say uh, south to, to uh, uh, let's see, maybe southwest winds. And continuing pushing off as we get into Tuesday, being reinforced again Tuesday night with 45 knot southwest winds while pushing east into the southeast Pacific. And then by Thursday, pushing out of the even the Southern California swell window, Southern California at about 117, 118 west. So once you get east of there, unless you have some magic fetch pushing, pushing due south or even coming from the southeast, you're not going to get any swell potential. But as we get into Friday, another system is trying to develop, or forecast to develop, that is, southeast of New Zealand. As we get into Saturday, not quite there, but then on Saturday night, a solid gale finally pushes under New Zealand with 35 to 40 knot winds over a pretty broad area, and continuing as we get into Sunday night, fading some with winds down to 30 to 35 knots, but we'll see. Good upper level support there. Maybe those winds will get traction on the ocean surface. So now we're looking at significant wave heights, the effect of those winds on the ocean surface. But we're going back. You see here, Sunday, the 8th of May, a week ago, a gale developed southeast of New Zealand, not a particularly big one, 26 foot seas, 27.9 actually to be exact in one pixel right there, and then building to about the 29 foot range, and then nearly 30 feet, and starting to push out of the Southern California swell window later on Monday. But another gale developed right behind that southeast of New Zealand with initially about 37 uh, foot seas and then fading some, but continuing to push off to the east with additional fetch behind that, generating anywhere from 20 to 
36 foot seas. Swell is in the water from both of these systems. In fact, let's just sort of wind this out. You see after that, things quieted down and now we are at current time. But swell is in the water. Even as we speak right now, tiny bits of energy starting to push into Southern California. Maybe pure swell, one foot at 17 seconds, something like that. But swell is expected to continue to build through the work week. Nothing huge, maybe, you know, two and a half feet at 15 seconds, something like that in the three foot range, which could put uh, sets, top spots, in the head high, something like that, maybe even a little bit overhead, top spots in Southern California. So swell is expected for the work week. Nothing huge, but certainly rideable. And then looking forward, all right, we know that there is a fetch forecast to develop, and here we go. Monday evening, nothing huge, 28 foot seas, and then in the 20, oh, there we go, 30 foot, 32 feet, something like that as we get into Wednesday, sort of taking the same track as the gale before it across the Southeast Pacific and then out of the Southern California, even the Southern California swell window as we get into Thursday night, Friday. But never to fear another gale forecast. Of course, it's a week out, but Saturday night, Sunday under New Zealand with uh, 35 foot seas, Lifting well to the northeast, this will put Hawaii in the game as well and uh, aim pretty well at everywhere from uh, Chile on up to the Hawaiian Islands. So something to monitor, but still a pretty long ways out. Looking for wind swell next. California there, high pre uh, low pressure in the Gulf of Alaska, but high pressure generally dominating the scene. Trades lighter for the Hawaiian Islands here in the 15 knot range. It's been blowing pretty hard pretty long for weeks now. Uh, this is all, and same thing along California, just nuking northwest winds. All this is pretty typical of La Nina, with high pressure stronger than normal in the Gulf of Alaska, creates that gradient along the California coast, making northwest winds, causing upwelling and making water temperatures drop, and then building a persistent fetch around the southern edge of the high, pushing into the Hawaiian Islands. But that is not really happening right now. So we get into Monday, Northwest winds continue for California, 15 to 20 knots, and light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Tuesday, fetch starts building. High pressure builds closer to California, 20 to 25 knot winds over a building area. Now, notice low pressure here. Uh, northwest of Hawaii turns winds, winds out of the south. Not so good for the south shore. Uh, probably okay for, for north-facing shores. Wednesday, almost looks like a front approaching the Hawaiian Islands. Strong uh, northwest winds continue 20-25 knots for uh, north and central California. So we get into Thursday, pretty much the same scenario, only winds building almost to 30 knots. And there we go, 35 knots on Thursday afternoon with some sort of a southeasterly flow continuing for the Hawaiian Islands. Friday, again, 30 knot north winds, but now limited to northern California. This looks like more like a typical summertime pattern. We get that gradient just off of uh, Cape Mendocino down to Point Arena, and then the wind swell radiates into the, the remainder of north and central California without the effects of uh, strong winds. Trades continue for the Hawaiian Islands. Saturday, pretty much the same thing. And Sunday, Pretty much the same thing. Trades pick up a little bit for the Hawaiian Islands, so maybe some minimal wind swell there, but most of the action expected for Northern California from a wind swell perspective. Rainfall potential for California. California right there, it's mid-May. You would not expect there to be anything, and we'll just blast through this because there isn't anything, um, but we're just pr we're basically beating a dead co horse and saying, yeah, verify. Uh, winter is over for California. We'll take a quick look at the snow panel. And as expected, no snowfall expected. But what's really interesting here is the the freezing line, currently about 12,000 feet. This is for uh, Squaw Valley, Olympic Valley. Um, and holding there, maybe a little dip into the 19th of May. But then you see the freezing line which was 12,000 feet, goes way above 14,000 feet, which would indicate a significant warm-up for the California area at that time. All right, let's go take a look long-term. What's going on with the Madden-Julian Oscillation? Of course, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. That is La Nina and El Nino. So first up, we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation. There's two phases to it, active and inactive. The active phase is on one side of the planet, the inactive phase on the other side 
They rotate around the planet, uh, opposed to one another. When the active phase pushes over the Pacific, and it ro it, the uh, MJO rotates from west to east, so the active phase would first show up in the West Pacific. When it does that, it's over what we call the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. Now, the active phase of the MJO, being a low pressure system uh, generates rainfall, but it also can reverse trade winds. It does the opposite of enhancing trades. It actually dampens trades, can reverse them. And that can take warm water that's in the equatorial West Pacific, start pushing it east in the form of a Kelvin wave, a ball of warm water that travels under the equator from the West Pacific to the East Pacific, and eventually would erupt off of Ecuador. If you have successive, stronger, active phases of the MJO that create successive Kelvin waves, that creates warming in the East Pacific, and that can help usher in El Nino, which, of course, then helps feed energy to the jet stream, and in winter months and in the summer months, really starts feeding the storm track. La Nina does the exact opposite. It's like high pressure. It steals energy from the jet stream. It enhances trade winds and sort of just dampens the storm machine. All right, so we're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. East Pacific here, West Pacific here. Here's the equator. Just looking at the arrows. These are There's wind sensors on those buoys. The length of the arrow determines the speed and, of course, the direction. Pretty self-evident. East trades pretty strong in the East Pacific. Central Pacific, so Hawaii would be like right in here, but north of here. This is only from 10 north to 10 south. And it's really only the area 5 north to 5 south that really matters. But trades moderately to strong over the Central Pacific. And in the Kelvin wave generation area, the West Pacific, from 5 degrees north to 5 degrees south, from 135 east, that's New Guinea right there, out to just past the date line, 170 west right there. That's where you want to see trade winds reversed, but we don't see any of that. We see trades out of the east, moderately strong. But it's not the actual speeds. These are average speeds over the past uh, um, couple of days. It's the anomaly, differences from normal for this time of year. See, yeah, trades are pretty strong here in the East Pacific, but look at the arrows. They're going north and south. So there's no, they're not any stronger out of the east than normal. Pretty much the same under Hawaii. In the Kelvin Wave Generation area, trades slightly stronger than normal, but not particularly. So certainly not the active phase of the MJO, but certainly not a strong inactive phase either. Let's go look at the forecast for the next week. Zonal wind anomalies, the east-west component of the wind. The blues are stronger than normal easterly winds. The yellows and reds, westerly winds. The east winds, that's enhanced trades. It's synonymous with the inactive phase of the MJO. The yellows and reds, the active phase of the MJO. But let's get ourselves oriented. This is not the Pacific. This is the whole planet. Dateline, 180 degrees, runs right up the middle. The far west Pacific, about 135 east, so right about there. So it's this area, and uh, this is past performance here, and this is the forecast down here. So Kelvin Wave Generation Area from 135 east to 170 west, so that box right in there. All right, and you can see clearly in the past, we've had a lot of strong easterly anomalies, a bit of westerly anomalies tried to encroach in the Kelvin wave generation area, and they look like they're making their way across, but this would be at best a extremely weak active phase of the MJO. And you see easterly anomalies forecast to rebuild about three or four days from now, so no clear sign of the active phase of the MJO. Now, I said the active phase of the MJO is like a low-pressure system, and low-pressure systems generate clouds. The inactive phase is like a high-pressure system, and high pressure, of course, produces clear air. So this is outgoing long-wave radiation, just a fancy word for cloud cover. The blues, negative anomalies, meaning more clouds, less sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface. So one could say the blues are the active phase of the MJO. And the reds and yellows, more sunlight reflectivity off the ocean. So the inactive phase. And let's get ourselves oriented here. The equator, EQ, runs right through the middle. South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea, Australia, Kelvin Wave Generation Area. So 135 East would be right about there. And so out to the date line, this area right here, that's all we're interested in. Active phase of the MJO over that area right now, according to the statistic model. And yeah, we saw 
light west anomalies in this area. So makes sense. But five days from now, according to the statistic model, that's to be fading. The inactive phase trying to make its way into the West Pacific 10 days from now, but then that falling apart in a dead neutral pattern two weeks from now. The dynamic model, pretty much saying the same thing. Active phase fading five days from now, weak inactive phase, and it fading out too. Hmm, things are moving very fast, at least from an NJO perspective. Just looking at these two pictures, let's look at some more detail. So these are phase diagrams, just uh, amplification of the previous two models. Statistic model here, dynamic model here. The MJO moves west to east from the Indian Ocean over the Maritime Continent to the West Pacific to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot right here is where the active phase is. No surprise, it's in the Western Pacific. The further the dot is away from this circle, the stronger it is. So a weak to modest active phase of the MJO. You really want to see it up here, then you get serious activity. And these are the three forecast members from the statistic model, all suggesting the active phase moving to, well, let's say the far east Atlantic, if not over Africa two weeks from now, and there, anything out inside of the circle or near the circle is weak, so exceedingly weak active phase. The dynamic model suggests the same thing, but the active phase racing fast even further back over the maritime continent two weeks from now. That's, that's really moving and incredibly weak. So both models more or less in agreement, suggesting no significant active phase activity other than what's happening right now and maybe for the next two or three days, and then it's all over. All right, so let's go look at the CFS model. And this one goes out one month from May 14th to June 11th. All right, and again, Kelvin wave generation area. This is the whole planet in one chart. The blues are easterly anomalies. The reds and, uh, and oranges, westerly anomalies. The westerly anomalies, of course, active phase, the MJO, blues in active phase. You can just eyeball this right here and say, geez, it doesn't even look like we've had a legitimate active phase for months. And that's pretty much the, the, the deal with La Nina. That said, the solid dark contour here is the active phase of the MJO. And you can see back in, uh, we'll say mid to late March, an active phase pushed its way across the Pacific with westerly anomalies trying to build into the Kelvin wave generation area. Again, from about here, just go right up the chart to about here. And yes, westerly anomalies did occur. And then this dotted black line, that's the inactive phase of the MJO. And then here we go, We're actually starting tomorrow, another inactive phase is to be moving very quick across the Kelvin wave generation area, generating easterly anomalies for one, not even two weeks, maybe about 10 days. And then you can see here the active phase of the MJO sets up late in May and makes its way across the Pacific. So if there was a shot for enhanced storm production, I'd say it would be in this late May to early June time frame. And if there is a time for de decreased or depressed storm production, it would be probably in the next week to 10 days, something like that. So this is why we watch the MJO, because it gives you a sense of when is it going to feed it? When is the uh, atmosphere going to feed energy to the jet stream and feed storm production? Or versus when's it going to steal energy away? And if you notice in winter months, certainly on good years, it's like storms come in bundles and it goes just crazy for two or three weeks. And then things go quiet for three or four weeks. It actually takes probably a month to five weeks for the active phase of the MJO to make it across the Pacific. But it's that period from when the M the active phase is in the far west Pacific to about, you know, two thirds of the way across the Pacific, that's when it really does its magic. So that's why we are so interested in the active phase, the MJO. So let's look even further out. Let's go out three months. This is the CFS model, 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. Okay, yellows, westerly anomalies, blues, easterly anomalies, whole planet on one chart, Kelvin wave generation area starts right about here, and you just go right up the chart. Okay, now the forecast is up here. What has happened in the past is down here, and you just see a preponderance of blues, easterly anomalies, centered right on the date line right there. You notice that starting about the end of May, 
Westerly anomalies are spart supposed to start encroaching, filling the Kelvin wave generation area, and continuing in some fashion even to here. That is just eyeballing it real quick. That's about 170 east, maybe 175 east. Okay, and the model, this model has been su consistently suggesting that. Also notice the easterly anomalies, they were focused about, about on the date line all this winter. And now just in the next week or two, they're supposed to recenter themselves somewhere like 135 west. So that'd be just off the coast of California. And westerly anomalies supposed to fill the Kelvin wave generation area from here moving forward. Um, if this happens and we've been talking about this every week, that'd be a really good thing. That would suggest that La Nina was weakening, starting to move further east, if it can get out of the Kelvin wave generation area. And really, this is also symptoms of what they call the Walker circulation. We're really not going to get into it. But this is, it's a big circulation that goes, so if the West Pacific, uh, let's see, I got to do this reverse for you guys. West Pacific here, East Pacific over here, so you'd have falling air here. It goes across the Pacific and then rises over on the west, in the West Pacific, right? So rise, uh, I have that right? Yes. So this is your falling air, okay? This is your falling air. This is your rising air. This is your low pressure, okay? And we'll get into that in a minute. But let's overlay the MJO. All right, so right now, Weak in the dotted contour, weak in active phase of the MJO. This was supposed to be dead about about a week from now. Now it's creeping out a little bit longer. But now a stronger active phase is forecast, dragging westerly anomalies with it, filling the Kelvin wave generation area. And even the there's an inactive phase forecast as we get into the first week of June through about the end of July, but even then westerly anomalies continue. And then as we get to the beginning of fall, a stronger active phase is forecast with stronger westerly anomalies possibly resulting. Let's overlay the low pass filter here. All right, this is your low pressure, high pressure bias, the dotted contour, high pressure bias, right? La Nina, El Nino. So you notice all winter long, high pressure has been basically over the date line. This doesn't mean all the time, but just a tendency towards high pressure. And with two contours here, now by June 16th or 18th, something like that, that second contour is supposed to fade. To fade. You also, well, you almost want to hope that you see the western edge of this low pressure bias moving off to the east. Not too much, but the sense is that it is moving. The low pressure bias, which has been centered about 110 east, is supposed to start recentering itself just barely, the core of it just barely in the Kelvin wave generation area, with its leading edge at about, no, just eyeballing it, about 165 east, something like that. So this is interesting. This doesn't do anything for this summer, and Maybe in the winter time, maybe by fall, it will suggest a potential shift in the pattern. That doesn't mean that we might not escape La Nina this winter, but the thought would be if we did have La Nina this winter, it'd be bare minimum La Nina, which is a lot better than a strong La Nina, and that the tendency would be for that to be fading as we get into January and February, not of this year, but of 2023, that maybe uh, the La Nina thing would just completely fade out and we'd be moving at least into a neutral pattern. But that is just speculation at this time. And with that, let's go look at the more details. We're done with the MJO now. Let's talk about El Nino, La Nina. We're going to start by looking down in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, West Pacific here, East Pacific here, data from the TAO buoy array, that series of buoys used for monitoring El Nino. The X is here. There's actually X's there. These are the anchor lines on the TAO buoys strung the whole way across the Pacific, just on the equator. The X's are actually the sensors on the anchor lines. They collect subsurface water temperature down 100, 200, 300 meters. So that would be 900 feet, roughly 600 feet, 300 feet. 
And what this does is uh, then you now notice there's a big gap between each of the anchor lines, but you use a model to synthesize what, what is happening between those sensors and get a profile of the hot and cold water balance in the Pacific. Warm water here, this is in right there, you barely see it. That's the 29 degree isotherm, that's 29 degrees Celsius, pretty warm water. 28 degree isotherm, rock solid at 175 west, that's good news. The 26 degree isotherm, right at about 135 west, I think that's where it was last week. And the 24 degree isotherm pushing into Ecuador, so pretty much no change. No obvious sign of Kelvin waves, but you know what, this is better than last winter where the 24 degree isotherm never made it past 140. It's making its way the whole way across the Pacific now. And now this model, this is anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. That's just the temperatures. But historically, is this any different than what it ever is? That's what this picture tells you. It says warm water, three degrees above normal in the West Pacific, and a finger of it reaching the whole way across the Pacific. That's interesting. That is a Kelvin wave. That is warm water. So if you had the active phase of the MJO over here, over the West Pacific, gener reversing trades, generating westerly winds, that would take warm water that's here, start pushing it off to the west, but not on the surface, under the surface, and create this kind of a pattern, which would be basically feeding warm water into the East Pacific and warming temperatures there. Now, this is just one model's guess of what's going on. Uh, this is probably an optimistic guess. Let's look at another model. Here we go. Here's probably the more conservative and probably more accurate model because the, the previous model was just getting its data from the TA buoy array. This model picks it up from a bunch of different sources. Still, it's suggesting a Kelvin wave, warm water, pushing to, what is that, about 140 west. And we're waiting for the next update here, any day now, probably Monday. And we suspect this will even be making its way further to the east. And this cool water pool that's been here uh, for uh, since the last Kelvin wave arrived, we're going to get into that in a minute, um, this is shrinking. This was generated by that pack of westerly anomalies and a Kelvin wave the uh, the westerly anomalies that were in the uh, associated with the active phase of the MJO in the late March and April time frame, we believe that is the Kelvin wave that is in flight now. So these waters have been in movement since uh, what was it late uh, sometime in early April. It takes about three months, maybe even more, sometimes four months for a Kelvin wave to make its way across the Pacific, and the stronger the wind velocity and the broader the fetch that of westerly winds that creates the Kelvin wave, the faster it moves. This one's moving very slow and ha and if not stalled, we thought it was stalled two weeks ago, uh, is not, I mean, it's not a strong Kelvin wave, but anything is good news compared to where we've been. All right, let's move on. Sea surface height anomalies, another way to see where warm and cold water are in the Pacific. So this is, let's get Orient here, Chile, Peru, Central America, Hawaii right there, equator there, dateline there, uh, New Guinea right there, Australia down there. We're only interested, oh, 10 degrees north, 10 degrees south. We're only interested in 5 degrees north and south of the equator. That's pretty much it. Okay, now, minus 5, minus 10, minus 15, but these are outside of the realm. That's centimeters. Plus 5 centimeters, plus 5, maybe some 10s scattered about minus 5, minus 10 there. Okay, that's uh, the Galapagos there. So this is the, the, the oceans, the sphere of the ocean. That is, if you take out the waves, the wind waves, the tide, is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal? If you have warm water at depth, it expands, creates a bump on the ocean surface. Cold water at depth contracts, creates a divot on the ocean surface. This suggests that we have a bump working its way across the Pacific. Okay, there's also a little bit of a current thing going on here, a cross current, and warm water is trying to push its way uh, across the Pacific on the surface here as well. But the thought is, well, there's a Kelvin wave. Oh, let's see if we can get 140. You notice there's no negative anomalies really in this area. And this area here is slowly losing ground. This There was up to minus 15 centimeters, even I think last week and, and even after that. So a little bit at a time, this cool pool here is fading as the Kelvin wave tries to push its way across the Pacific. 
And this chart really tells the picture. Okay, it goes back a year, West Pacific here, East Pacific here. The reds and yellows warmer than the normal temperatures. The blues colder than normal temperatures. July, oh, Kelvin wave. There was a good Kelvin wave. This was last like April and May and June. One Kelvin wave there, one there. And then come July, we had the La Nina machine, machine just fire up. Trade started nuking and we had one, two, three. Uh, cold upwelling events, and then there was an active phase of the MJO that tapped this warm water back in uh, late December, created a Kelvin wave that made its way across the Pacific. Then the upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle, and now our uh, our our last uh, active phase of the MJO in the April time frame right here has created this bit of a Kelvin wave. It looks like it's stalled, but we think it's moving. We think within the next week. This chart will show some movement at least to 150, if not further than that. But that's just a guess. See surface temperatures. Now you notice there's a big difference between what's happening on the surface and what's going on underneath. Underneath the ocean, we know there's warm water. It's moving to about 150 west. That'd be right, There's Hawaii right there. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. Chile, Peru, Central America, uh, Baja, Hawaii. The warm water pool is somewhere in this area, right on the equator right here. But you notice above it, temperatures much colder than normal, the blues. Okay. Now, what we're really watching, though, is right here, this pocket of cool water, these dark, darker. It was much, much stronger two and three weeks ago. We think the subsurface cool pool is being squeezed. So the Kelvin wave is like in this area pushing this direction, and it's squeezing this pocket of cool subsurface water to the surface along here. And as this starts fading, that suggests that that cool pool, uh, the subsurface cool pool, is losing its intensity and being wrung out. And that's exactly what we want to see. We want to see warmer temperatures building here, because when that happens, then that suggests a return at least to a more normal pattern. Right now, though, clearly La Nina signal in control with colder than normal water temperatures, you know, from uh, from South America up to the equator, pretty much the whole way across the Pacific. Cold water supports high pressure, and high pressure is not a friend. Sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days. Just look for little micro trends. We see a little bit of warming off of Ecuador here. Oh, and all we're interested in is Pacific Ocean, and all we're really interested in is about the area from uh, Ecuador and the Galapagos out to point south of Hawaii, something like that. A little bit of warming here, a little bit of cooling north of the, or, yeah, just right on the Galapagos here, but no wholesale trend whatsoever, kind of a neutral state for right now. And then the backed off overview picture, you can see it quite clearly. South America, broad pool of cooler than normal water supporting high pressure. Also, high pressure off of California creating upwelling along the coast here. Pretty typically, you get this return flow that actually outlines high pressure here. There's dead air in the middle of high pressure, so the sun can really cook the ocean and warm it up here. But along the coast here, you where the high pressure starts bumping into the land, it gets that Venturi effect going and starts creating upwelling, dropping temperatures. Same thing going on here. High pressure, but it rotates uh, counterclockwise, stirring up and mixing the ocean here. So high there, high there, enhancing the trades across the equator. And that is the hallmark of La Nina. If we got warmer water here, that would cut the legs out of the high and then start to lower pressure and then we'd be in a more neutral pattern. Sea surface temperature index in the Nino 1.2 region, that's the area just right there along uh, north of Peru, off of Ecuador and the Galapagos. Temperatures pretty much where they were last week, minus 1.825 degrees below normal. That's pretty chilly indeed, clearly a sign of La Nina. In the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 index, in fact, let's visualize it here. Nino 1.2 is like right around in there. It's a small area. No surprise, temperatures are cold. Okay, the Nino 3.4 index starts at 120, or, or the Nino 3.4 area starts at 120 west, 5 degrees north and south of the equator, out to about 170 west. So right in there. And you can see temperatures cooler than normal. 
And here we go. Today's value, 968 thousandths of a degree below normal. Uh, nor Zero is neutral. Anywhere from a half a degree below normal to half a degree above normal is considered the normal range. When you get above half a degree for five consecutive three months periods, that's considered El Nino. When you get below here, and as you see, we have been nowhere near even the, the highest, you know, the minimum threshold to be out of La Nina. We haven't been anywhere near that for two years. <laughs> so clearly a well dug in La Nina is in control. So what does the atmosphere think is going on? Clearly there's a lot of cold water on the equator across the entire equatorial Pacific. One would think that would support high pressure. So we look at the different, this is the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Tahiti, which is in the Pacific, and Darwin, which is roughly in the Indian Ocean Maritime Continent. Darwin, Australia, that is. When the index is negative, that means pressure is lower in Tahiti. When it's positive, that means pressure is higher in Tahiti. Today's value, not too bad, 3.08. But you look back, we were at plus 40.77. I think that was a new high record, at least for the past six months. And scanning down for the past month, you see a preponderance of 20s and 30s and just pretty much a miserable setup, clearly indicative of La Nina. 30-day average takes some of the noise out of this. You know, you know, you go from 3 to, to 40 to 3. Okay, get an average, 19.67. Well, that beat where our high of La Nina was last year. And last year it did it in January. So it took uh, another five months to get there this year. But still, oh, actually we were at 20.3. 3.4. Last year, I think our high was 19.5 or something like that. So still, you know, we beat last year's La Nina from a atmospheric perspective. From a water temperature perspective, it was actually colder last year than this year. But still, same deal going on. 90-day average, this is your El Nino La Nina indicator plus 14.81. Uh, the highest I, I think we got last year was plus 15. And given all these positive values down here, I think we're going to beat the last year's La Nina high as well. Maybe in the next week or two or three, something like that. We'll have to see. And there's a stack of significantly high numbers here. So we expect we're going to pretty much blow well past the 15, the plus 15 reading from last year. So La Nina clearly still in control. Here is the 30-day moving SOI average graphed out so you can just sort of see what's going on going back January 2020 into about the spring there. That was the last we saw of anything that was neutral to slightly El Nino-ish like. And then 2020, well actually, yeah, the 2020-21 winter, there is our, this says plus 20.5. Uh, another index that we've been following says uh, plus 19. There's a little bit of difference in the two. This year's high, you can see it already blew past that one. But notice this was in January. January this year, we were down here. It's taken another couple of months to get to that record high, suggesting maybe some delayed effect or just some weakness. To me, it, it smells of weakness in La Nina. It took it a lot longer to climb up to that high to reach that level. Um, also, the downward spikes are the active phase of the MJO. The upward spikes are the inactive phase. When you get up in, you know, any of this when you're above zero, that clearly shows that the inactive phases of the MJO are stronger than the active phases. To get into negative ter territory, reverse is true. The negative, or the, the, uh, um, active phases of the MJO are stronger than the inactive phases. So clearly still in La Nina territory, but where are we going? All right, the CFS model forecasts sea surface temperatures in the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino monitoring region. This is raw data, okay? The solid line here is actuals going back a year ago, 2021. You see, oh, and a half degree below normal, that's your uh, La Nina threshold. So clearly all last, uh, let's see, last fall, all last winter, negative territory. This is the forecast start. So we're in, and th this line here, that's the middle of April. So right about the middle of May would be right about there. Suggesting temperatures as low as they're going to go and creeping up from here in July, making it 
just barely to the not even neutral, just barely neutral uh, um, um, threshold, but then falling back down to about nine tenths of a degree below normal in November. But then after that, as we get into January and February, temperatures La Nina just over and evaporating according to this. Now this is the raw data. This is the corrected version. There is some known biases in this model. And this suggests, yes, as we get in July, temperatures about minus four tenths of a degree below normal, then falling back down to maybe three quarters of a degree below normal in November, and then heading back up from there. Um, we were looking at the three months out, so that'd be, let's see, so we're in May, June, July, August, somewhere in, the, somewhere in here. This is when the low pressure bias and westerly anomalies were supposedly supposed to be taking over, certainly in this time frame. The, looking at this, that would suggest that the low pressure bias might weaken some and backtrack and westerly anomalies sort of lose their footing in the Kelvin wave generation area in the fall which would not bode well for surf in the fall. But then as we get into winter, now this is sea surface temperatures, all right? So this is definitely lagging. It would take Kelvin waves, westerly anomalies, and all sorts of stuff in play to get these temperatures to respond that this way. So if temperatures are rising as we get into January or even into, let's say, November, that would suggest that maybe the worst of our... Um, westerly anomaly weakness, the low pressure bias being in the wrong place would happen maybe right at the beginning of fall. And then after that, it's all uphill, uh, suggesting that officially, yeah, maybe you could, you could certainly say that we'd be in La Nina in January, right? Okay. But after that, the momentum in the atmosphere would be going in the right direction. In fact, from about November on, maybe even earlier, the mom it's about the momentum in the atmosphere. That's, you know, when the when there's energy going into the jet stream, okay, well, what would do that? Well, we'll take westerly anomalies in the West Pacific, the low pressure bias moving over the West Pacific, okay? And these temperatures here are a lagging indicator, sort of after the fact, which means that come maybe by about mid-fall, the atmosphere would be moving in the right direction. It would have momentum. It would be starting to feed energy to the jet stream. Maybe things would wake up. Now, that is a very optimistic uh, assessment right now. But just looking at this, and the model, this model has been dead steady on this, and it has beat every other model in predicting what's going to happen. So, assuming this to be true, and assuming a whole bunch of other stuff, maybe as we get into fall, though officially we'd be in La Nina, and maybe we'd be in La Nina almost into the mid part of winter, maybe the jet stream will sense what's coming and start activating and start producing more storms. And we might end up with maybe a near normal winter, late fall to winter, something like that. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get some precipitation into California. Now that's highly speculative, a wild guess at best, but just looking at this, that's sort of what it says right now. Now, of course, looking at a model going out a week is a fool's errand. Looking at a model going out three months is even more foolish, but this model has been done a reasonably accurate job, so maybe, just maybe, we have something to look forward to. All right, so let's reel ourselves in. Let's look at just the next week. Two swells on the way, small southern hemi swells, will provide surf. The first pulse for California, uh, start, it's starting now, and the second pulse for Hawaii as well as California will surf all through the work week and maybe into the weekend, though probably starting to fade. Beyond that, another two series of gales are forecast, so a continuation of small rideable southern hemi surf is expected. Long term beyond that, well, you know the drill. We're optimistic, we're looking, we're hoping, that uh, uh, La Nina will fade. We're hoping that a bunch of different things will come together. But right now, we'll just sort of reel it in and say, well, a continuation of some borderline weak La Nina, probably through the fall and winter. All right, that's it for this week. Enjoyed the video. Thanks. Give us a thumbs up, you know, and uh, comments, all that sort of stuff. You're welcome. And go surf, get some waves, try to have some fun, and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Take care. Mm -hmm.